Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Penn State College of Medicine COVID-19 in Regional Skilled Nursing Facilities ECHO Series. We're delighted to have you join us for this session. My name is Jackie Sable. I'm a member of the ECHO team, and I'll be facilitating today's session. A few quick announcements before we begin. If you've not already done so, please put your name and email address in the chat function for our record keeping purposes. Please stay muted unless you're speaking. You can use star six on your phone or the microphone icon on the Zoom screen on your computer to mute and unmute. And you can also use the chat for communicating. Um, we do encourage the use of webcams. So if you have access to one, please feel free to keep it turned on. Um, we realize that question and answer time is very important to you and we try to categorize and address as many questions as possible. But if there are questions that remain unanswered, we will always follow up with any um, information after the session. Please remember that if we're discussing cases, no personally identifiable information or PHI is allowed. We are recording these sessions and we share the materials and recordings after each session. In the spirit of Project ECHO's all teach all learn approach, we will be on a first name basis during the session. Our ECHO sessions always begin with a brief lecture and they're followed by um, discussion and question and answer time. Today's session will include a brief lecture on opening nursing homes to visitors by Dr. Ayesha Ahmed, um, followed by a discussion and again question and answer period. During the lecture, please feel free to put your questions into the chat we do have a team of specialists from Penn State Online and they do help field questions um, or we will address those questions um, after the lecture. But remember that this is all teach, all learn, so everyone can share both questions and answers. Um, in the interest of time, we will not be doing introductions. So as you interact during the session today, please announce yourself by name. And with that, I am going to turn things over to Aisha for our lecture. Hi everyone, nice to be back. Um, I see there are about 46 participants. So thank you for all your introductions and thank you for joining the session today. Um, so today's talk is about reopening our facilities to visitors in the age of COVID-19. Um, and just a little bit of a background. Um, COVID-19 um, is a respiratory illness caused by the novel SARS-CoV-2 virus. It spread from China in December 2019 and became a worldwide pandemic by early March. As of August 14th in Pennsylvania, we've had uh, approximately 7,445 deaths from COVID-19. And a high number of these deaths, as you can see on the slide, almost six seven or 68 percent are happening um, in um, nursing homes and ALs. Um, about 890 facilities are affected. We have more than 20,000 cases uh, with a large number of deaths that have happened in nursing homes. So um, uh, it always sobers me up to look at the number because we don't want to forget how serious this pandemic was and is. So I'm sure all of you who work in um, skilled nursing facilities and AL remember the date, March 13th, when the CDC recommendations came out. And I think most facilities were very nimble on acting on these and they restricted all visitors. Uh, the only visitors that were allowed in nursing homes were obviously physicians, um, nurse practitioners, uh, physician assistants, um, nurses and CNAs. Along with that, uh, dialysis staff, um, end of life visitors, hospice staff, and public health officials were allowed. Um, ombudsman and um, um, uh, area uh, agency on aging uh, is included in that. However, a lot of, in my experience, a lot of those matters have been handled um, remotely or digitally. So it's been five months. Our residents are, you know, deeply affected by not meet, being able to meet their friends and families. And I think it's time for many facilities to consider opening up. Some of you may have gingerly opened up or maybe in step two or step three already. 
Some of you are not there yet. Um, so I think the regional facilities are all kind of on a different timeline, depending on when you had an outbreak or if you had an outbreak. And when was your last case? So uh, basically, um, the first step before you consider reopening your facility to visitors is make sure you have met all the prerequisites. And I thought I'll put all the prerequisites uh, even though they sound simple so we can review them. The first prerequisite is um, universal testing um, needs to have been completed on all residents and staff as mandated by the governor's mandate dated June 8th, 2020. Um, the facilities you work at must be alliance with a testing uh, lab that has the capacity to test all residents and all staff with a decent turnaround time if needed. You must have a procedure for testing volunteers. You must have a sort of a written plan and procedure to cohort depending on the PA hand that came out uh, late May and early June. You should have a written screening protocol for all staff for beginning and end of shift and for all residents to be uh, screened for symptoms. And I think most of the nursing homes I experience uh, have been doing that really well. You should have a safe cachet of PPE for future needs. Uh, depending on you know how busy your facility is and um, how um, uh, you know how uh, how many yellow and green zone uh, yellow and red zones you have, uh, you must not have a current or impending staff shortage uh, because the time to reopen should not be around a time when you're in crisis mode for staff shortage. You should have a plan to allow for communal dining and activities to resume. You should have a plan to allow for visitation pursuant to the guidance. You should have a plan to halt all reopening facilities if the county in which the facility is located is reverted to a red phase. Um, you kind of need to con constantly reassess if your county is yellow or green. Uh, as far as I know, most of the counties where our regional nursing homes are green. Um, and you should, if possible, post the implementation plan for reopening on your facilities website if you do have a, a facility website. So that is strongly encouraged. I thought that this um, attachment from the Department of Health really made things very simple. Um, every blue diamond is basically um, you know, reassessing whether you've had new cases or not. And then every green square is, you know, moving forward from uh, pre-contemplation to step one, to step two, to step three. And then every uh, red square or rectangle basically tells you that if you're not meeting those guidelines or if you've had a new outbreak, then you need to kind of move back um, to, um, um, uh, to before step one. So the first step, which uh, hopefully many of you are in that stage yet, is making sure that you have met all the prerequisites that I went over in detail in the previous slide. Then you make sure you have no COVID-19 cases in your residence or in your staff for 14 consecutive days since the last baseline testing. And then you are ready to move to step one. Um, and we'll kind of talk about what happens in step one, step two, step three in the next few slides. Um, so 14 days now have elapsed, 14 additional days, and uh, there has been no new outbreak of COVID-19 cases, um, either in your residence or in your staff. Uh, if you meet that criteria, then you move on to step number two of reopening, and then um, another 14 days and you've been without COVID in either your residents or staff, you go on to step three. So as you can all imagine, moving from step one to step two to step three is a total of 42 days uh, with a 14 day uh, period in between. If during these uh, transitions, you get one or more cases of COVID-19, um, 
based on symptomatic testing or um, you know surveillance testing if your facility is doing that um, you kind of are stuck and you go all the way back to before step one um, and you have to close your facility for all kinds of visitation and communal activities so um, the most important thing about uh, reopening is reopening to visitors but um, i'm going to quickly talk about uh, you know how to reopen dining and activities and things like that before i move on to visitors just so that we're you know we kind of know what the um you know what reopening reopening encompasses more than just reopening for visitors so for um if your facility has moved to step one and by step one if you recall that you've met all the prerequisites and you haven't had a case of COVID-19 in residents or staff for 14 days, you're in step one. So um, you can open communal dining for residents that have not been exposed to COVID-19. They can eat in the same room with appropriate social distancing. I know that can be hard to do depending on the size of the facility. You should adhere to the precautions when meals are served in a common area. Um, and uh, you should not open dining services uh, unless you're, you know, you are definitely in step one and you have met all the criteria. Uh, recreational activities and other uh, activities that typically happen in a skilled nursing facility. If you're in step one, you can have limited activities with five or less residents unexposed to COVID-19. You should still practice social distancing, hand hygiene, and universal masking. So that's going to be the new normal. Uh, I'm sure you all realize that. If you're in step two, you should have um, limited activities, um, and you can, you know, increase the number of people to ten. And uh, if you're in step three, you can have, uh, you know, a larger number of people in your uh, recreational activities, but you will and must continue to practice social distancing, hand hygiene, and universal masking. If you're not able to do that, you should not proceed. Um, Non-essential personnel. Um, so other than the essential personnel, which are typically providers, healthcare providers, and hospice and chaplains, um, there are a number of non-essential personnel. Um, so in step one of reopening, uh, visitor policies, um, you should adhere to restrictions, um, which means that you should try to limit non-essential personnel. If you're in step two, um, non-essential personnel are allowed as determined necessary by the facility, uh, but they must practice social distancing, hand hygiene, universal masking. And if you're in step three, um, again, not very dissimilar from step two. Non-essential personnel are allowed with screening and additional precautions. Um, volunteers, I, I'm sure a lot of you um, have been missing the volunteers that you know work with the residents. So volunteers are limited in step one. Volunteers are allowed for the purpose of assisting with visitation protocols only. Um, and may only conduct volunteer duties with residents who have been unexposed to COVID-19 in step two. In step three, volunteers are allowed but may only conduct volunteer activities with residents unexposed to COVID-19. So as you see that when volunteers progress from step two to step three, they're allowed to assist with more than just visitation protocols. But at every step, Let's not forget social distancing and hygiene. The most important part, visitors, which our families have been pining for. So when you're in step one, you can't have visitors because you're hoping to move to step two and step three before you allow it. When you're in step two of your um, reopening phase, which generally means 28 days have elapsed, Outdoor visitation is allowed in neutral zones, and I'll describe in the next few slides what neutral zones are. Um, uh, so when you're arranging visitation outdoor, you also have to have the means so that weather does not permit 
outdoor vis uh, affect outdoor visitation. So your zone um, must be able to protect the residents and the visitors from excessive sun or rain um, or any other um, uh, you know, uh, weather related events. And when you're in step three, you can gingerly proceed to indoor visitation in the neutral zones, which must be designated by each facility depending on what their resources and what their facility looks like. The visitation is limited to residents unexposed to COVID-19. So nowhere at any point should you expose new transitions from the hospital or patients who may have been exposed to COVID-19 to visitors. Um, when you're in step three, which means 42 days have elapsed with your facility being COVID free, and let's say indoor visitation has started, visiting in a resident's room is permitted only if the resident is not able to be designated to a, design, to a, a neutral zone. So, um, so remember that, that ideally keep it outdoors or keep it in the neutral zone indoors. Um, so neutral zone. Neutral zone means that the area in your facility is a pass-through area. Your, you know, neutral zone must be distinct from the red and the green and the yellow zones where residents reside, which we have previously tackled on our presentations. So um, it could be a lobby, it could be a hallway, um, it could be um, outdoors, um, and it should not be an area which is typically occupied or frequented by residents. Um, and it definitely should not be an area where you've had um, uh, exposure to COVID-19. So, um, what are the visitation requirements? Well, first of all, when you reopen, you really need to reopen. You can't just let the floodgates, you know, go. Um, you must determine um, visitation hours. You must determine a neutral zone. You must determine um, that whichever area you pick for your visitation must have, must be amenable or conducive to uh, six feet social distancing. You have to also keep in mind that you need a lot of staff for scheduling, for screening all the visitors that will come in, for monitoring the visits, and for wiping down the area uh, after each visit. Um, you should determine the number of visitors depending on um, the protocols. Uh, it could be, you know, as little as four or as much as 10 or 15. I don't know what that number would be for each facility. I just looked up how, how other states are handling it. And apparently in New York, the visitation is going to be limited to only 10% of residents um, in the beginning. You should have an EPA approved disinfectant for wipe down, which hopefully all the facilities at this point have access to. You should prioritize visits depending on residents' conditions. And uh, obviously residents who have been more deeply affected by lack of their uh, family and friends visiting um, or who've had behaviors or who are end of life are obviously going to be higher on the list. Um, you must provide face masks to the residents. Uh, you also need to monitor what are the vi visitors' responsibilities. Don't presume that every visitor is going to follow the rules. Um, where the visitor must wear a face covering or face mask during the entire visit. It does not have to be a surgical mask for them. They must use an alcohol-based hand rub for and after every visit. They must stay in the designated facility and locations. They must sign in and provide contact information they must sign out upon departure and they need to kind of adhere to all the screening protocols that are required. Obviously, a lot of our residents have been looking forward to meeting their grandkids uh, and their uh, great grandkids. So children are permitted to visit when accompanied by an adult visitor with the number of allowable visitors as determined by the facility. Um, the adult visitor should be able to manage the children. It really should not be the responsibility of the nursing home staff. And children under two, uh, unless the children are uh, under two, they all must wear a face mask as well. Um, and, you know, that can be sometimes hard to implement. Um, children must also maintain social distancing. So 
they really shouldn't be hugging and kissing your residents. So um, I'll actually um, stop here. I put some frequently asked questions kind of an, in anticipation of what I've seen or heard from other um, facility administrators. So I put them in there um, and we can go over them, but I look forward to any other uh, questions that you may have about reopening. So one, one question that comes up is, what if you open and you know, you're in step two or step three and now suddenly a single resident or staff member tests positive? Um, so the answer to that is simple. You kind of go back. You go back to the prerequisite area and when your facility was completely close to visitors. So at that point, you are not allowing any new visitors. You stop communal dining. You stop all your recreational activities. You stop volunteer staff from coming in. Um, and you only adhere to the basic staff that was coming in and, and you know, in the last four months that where all the facilities were pretty much completely closed. Um, so it doesn't matter if you have one new case or two new cases or 15 new cases. Um, when you have a positive case, you go back. Um, and then the other questions, I'll let, um, if Dr. Osavala is on the meeting, I'll let her kind of tackle the next, uh, the next few questions just to break the monotony. <laughs> sure, I was just typing into the chat because I had this exact question come up today. So um, a facility that was doing window visits and now has an outbreak and some of the residents live in a room where there are no windows. And so they were bringing them out of their rooms to a common area with windows where their family could uh, visit. And the question was, you know, now that we only have a yellow zones and a red zone, can we still take these residents out of their rooms um, to do these window visits? Um, and I'm curious before I tell you what I advised, if any of you have had that experience and what your, what your gut says, if that's a yes or a, a no. You can put it in the chat if you don't want to. So your question is pertaining to your facilities basically not open to to in-person visits and you're still kind of before step one and um, you're in a common area with large windows on the first floor. <laughs> right, so the question is, can you safely move residents about in yellow zones to common areas to have window visits? And you know, really when you have an outbreak and you're in a yellow zone, that means you suspect that other residents and staff were exposed. Mm -hmm. Really, when, when you're in that situation, you're kind of in a shelter in place, you know, residents need to stay in their rooms um, position because you don't know if the resident that you're gonna move out to this common area, even if they're wearing a mask, um, may turn positive, you know, with the next round of universal testing. And so it really is a step backwards. And I know it, this is kind of even one, um, you know, one level behind what Dr. Ahmad was describing and looking forward and reopening but um, some of even the most basic ways you've been able to allow the, your residents to interact with their families in person, but separate it by a window, may not, you may not be able to accomplish if you have to physically move them from their rooms and through halls to a common area to accommodate the visit. Um, particularly if there is no way for them to exit that unit without moving through other areas. Uh, I do know there have been some facilities that ha have a separate exit, for example, um, where they may be able to move the resident from the yellow zone outside and do some sort of, you know, outdoor socially distanced with mask on type of um, meeting with family. Uh, and, you know, I think that that is, you know, one strategy to reduce the exposure to others. Um, is to use use all of your entrances and exits, but in in the setting of having uh, you know positive cases in the building in yellow zones, you know it's really advised to keep the residents in their rooms um, as much as possible. And if if they're coming out, they need to be masked. But I had in that instance advised against bringing them out to do these window visits in common areas um, to try to control the traffic um, throughout the building. Um, 
I think Dr. Ahmad, you you wanted my my uh, take on um, if you don't have outdoor space. I mean, I think this gets really tricky and really, um, you know, you have to think through what the recommendations are in the community. Um, and then I would say because these um, the residents of your homes are so fragile, you know, add even more vigilance to how you establish visitation. Um, I continue to advise whenever possible to make the visits outdoor, socially distanced with masks on, um, because we know that that is better than remaining indoors. Uh, however, if, if it needs to be an indoor space, again, the social, one, you need to think where it has to move through to get to that location, because you don't want them moving about your building. And two, if they're gonna do a one-on-one -on -one with their family, how do you maintain that social distancing, the, distancing the mask wearing? And I also um, advise to really think about the surfaces being touched by both the resident and the family members when they're in that space and being really vigilant about cleaning before the next family and resident uh, move through to, to um, visit. And so it is um, quite an undertaking and you really have to think through each piece of the visitation before actually um, beginning the visitation. Because as all of you know, um, if you've gone through the exercises of your universal testing and had someone pop up positive who is asymptomatic, you it's unpredictable. And just by virtue of them having been out of their rooms and in different areas um, can then reflect on how much lockdown or how many areas become yellow um, in your building. And so you really wanna be mindful of that um, when you're when you're starting to think about your visitation policies for the facility. I'll pause there and see if anyone has any questions or if Dr. Ahmad or any of, I see there are a few other providers. Um, wanted so I, my, my question is the outdoor space ideally should have a separate ingress and egress. That's ideal, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So there is a question in the chat. Is the cafeteria considered a neutral zone? I guess if it's not frequented, a cafeteria is frequented by residents, uh, by, by staff. Um, so Nikki, is, the, is that a safe zone or a neutral zone? I think it's, it, it only is a neutral zone if you can create make it a neutral zone. So mm. in normal times when it's normally used, I would say no, because, you know, at any time of day, I can go into a building and their residents, you know, maybe just sitting at the table with another resident, they may be um, snack or um, getting ready for their meals. So if you decide that that is the best place to facilitate um, visitation, then you have to set it up accordingly, both the entrance and exit the cleaning of the surfaces in that area, the ability to socially distance. And a lot of those areas are ideal because they're more spacious um, than other areas of your home. Uh, but then you may need to rethink how you're using it for the resident activities, um, the times of day that the residents are in there and how you're gonna clean um, in between um, the use of the residents or staff um, and when the family members are coming in, how you're cleaning before and after um, each visitation occurs. I think the next question on the FAQs was, how do you prioritize visits, you know, in large facilities with a number of residents? So other than end of life or patients who've had serious behaviors or, um, you know, mental health issues in, in this significant social isolation, do you have any other um, any other recommendations about prioritizing? No, I mean, I think you've certainly listed the residents that you would want to try to facilitate the visitation. You know, that being said, I know family members are, are missing their loved ones dearly and, and their residents miss their family as well. So it's hard to kind of um, objectively be able to um, prioritize um, outside of what Dr. Ahmad had said you know, the other piece would be to try to make it fair. So, you know, once you move through that priority list, then identifying, you know, are you going to set up if you have four units in your building? 
you know, how will you establish a visitation schedule that is easy for the families to keep track of, oh, Thursday is going to be our visitation day between this time, you know, so unit A, B, C, D, you know, visitation is, you know, Monday for unit A, Tuesday for unit B, Wednesday for unit C, um, Thursday for unit D between these hours, and make sure you're staffed accordingly, that you have the, you know, environmental services set up for that period of time to be able to actively, you know, clean in between visitations. It, you know, it's quite an undertaking. It's certainly um, the return to kind of an open door, you know, visit anytime during normal operating hours is not going to work. Um, you know, even when you're fully reopened, you're still going to have to be really thoughtful and strategic about how you schedule it. Um, not only for the benefit of the family, so they know on any given day of of the week, you know, when they can come and visit and what time, um, but also for your staff and, and how you prepare your staff to um, allow visitors to enter. Uh, and so I think that, you know, the days of being able to visit daily um, for spouses, for example, are going to be a real challenge, especially in, in bigger buildings. Um, and another question that comes up is, you know, we've all experienced that turnaround times for testing were reasonable and then went up when there was a crisis in the Sun Belt states. And now I think some of them are getting better. So, you know, um, what exactly is defined as a, a reasonable turnaround time when you reopen for visitation and you're worried that you need to have testing capacity? There's no good, I mean, I think turnaround time has been the, has been a struggle for almost everyone. Um, I know some sites in Pennsylvania have received uh, point of care equipment, but those are, you know, very, those are very few um, sites. And while we're hoping that the state in general will increase capacity for testing and that will reduce turnaround time, we also have schools reopening um, in the coming weeks and we don't know what sort of stress that will put on um, uh, the system. Um, we saw what it felt like a month ago when there were surges in Florida and Arizona and Texas and turnaround times from big commercial labs went from you know three or four days to 12 or 14 days which is essentially renders it useless. Um, and so I think we're in a window right now where the turnaround times have improved, but you need to be mindful of that as you're considering reopening and how you're gonna do it and the extent to which you're gonna do it um, based on your lab and what their turnaround times are looking like uh, as, you're, as you're reopening. Um, it, it's, uh, it definitely is something that you, you need to factor in. So before we jump into the next question, yeah. do you mind if we turn the slides off and then perhaps we can see everyone and have a little bit more of a discussion here? Sure, sure. Thank you. So Dr. Osevala, the last question is once, uh, the, the question I see listed is once a facility has had a COVID outbreak, what is the best strategy for starting to admissions after outbreak. So I, I understand you mean taking new transitions from the hospital. Um, so I you think, um, Go ahead, you can take that first Aisha and then I can. Yeah, I mean, you can take new admissions and make sure you have a plan of cohorting them and uh, new admissions ideally should go to a zone that has been designated as yellow. So even if they, uh, a lot of the facilities that we're accepting from are basically doing the COVID testing based on the requirement right before or one day before they're leaving. Um, and uh, so they come back, they come to us generally with a negative test or sometimes with a test pending. You should put them in a, uh, in a designated area, which is a yellow zone and ideally keep them there for 14 days. Um, uh, I think the business of medicine will go on and uh, your facilities have to be, um, so you need to have a plan to be reaccepting um, admissions as long as you are able to cohort them safely. 
Right. And I think, you know, the biggest thing with that is when you're, when you're reopening and taking admissions is having your cohorting strategy set, um, having a designated, um, you know, green, yellow for those admissions coming in and then a red zone. And, you know, this, uh, this uh, concept competes with um, the business concept of keeping the beds full because it's really hard to have a red zone with people in it. And then when you, if you have an outbreak, um, then not having beds available to move those residents to. Uh, and so, um, you know, really, and ideally you have at least not one bed, because we saw a lot of facilities were really well-intentioned and had two beds, but when they had an outbreak had 10 people they needed to cohort. So you need to at least have you know, I would say four, four rooms, if you are a facility that has shared rooms, you know, so that you have the ability to cohort more than a couple of people at once to a red zone. And by doing that, you can control where that zone is. Um, when you do it in uncontrolled fashion, the red zone ends up being wherever the outbreak was, could, and it could be in the least ideal spot. It could be where everybody has to walk through to get to the green zone, um, for example. And so, you know, the, the best way to control the situation is by having these designated areas in advance and sticking to them, even if that means there are a handful of beds that remain empty um, throughout the next several months so that you can quickly move them to the least trafficked, the, you know, the best ventilated um, area of the facility. Uh, and then, you know, as far as the yellow zone, same thing. If you're able to, um, have a yellow zone in an area where it's easily, you know, away from the green zone, uh, an area where you naturally can have um, dedicated staff that aren't moving about to other areas. Uh, you know, that is going to be more ideal than putting the yellow zone on the third floor where now you're on elevators and there are staff up and down various floors. So, you really have to be strategic in thinking about how you want to create your zones, putting the red and the yellow zones in areas where you know that they are as far off as possible from where most of the traffic is going to be. And that protects the folks that are in the green zones then. So they're very, un, you know, they're far less likely to a staff member who walked through a green zone to get to their yellow zone where they're providing resident care. I think that kind of touched on Dr. Chigbu's question for buildings heavily dependent on elevators. Is there a recommendation in managing the flow of traffic? Um, but what about visitors? Right. Well, you know, I, I, when I'm in the hospital, I think about that often too. Um, there are signs outside of the elevators that, you know, strongly suggest limiting the number to a few people and distancing on the elevator. Obviously, everyone wearing masks. Uh, you know, I think that in, you know, in buildings where there are elevators, um, having signage like that is really important. Um, you know, if you have stairwells open, I think that is something you really have to consider about high touch areas and how you're going to um, clean those, those uh, stairwells um, throughout the day. Um, I don't know. I don't even, I don't think hospitals have come up with a great idea on how to manage the traffic of people coming on and off elevators. I think the biggest thing is, is signage that um, reminds people to not pack into an elevator um, and uh, distancing on the elevator and, and wearing masks. Um, and, and I think some people say, some ball, you know, not each other. So go on the four corners of the elevator and face the wall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of like you're in timeout. Right. And the only other thing I would say, and um, I think we're seeing this a bit more in the nursing homes, is your eye protection too. You know, especially if you're in a community where there's a bit more transmission. Um, you know, I think it's really important to, to wear your eye protection when you're in close contact with residents. But we know from many outbreaks that the employees are vectors for the residents as well as one another. And so just because you're on an elevator with one of your colleagues um, does not mean that, you know, they may have, they may be asymptomatic and infectious. And so, you know, the other thing to consider is the eye protection you're wearing, not only when you're in um, providing direct uh, patient care, but also 
um, eye protection when you're moving about the building, especially when you know you may be in an enclosed space for a short period of time where, you know, the social distancing is happening, but maybe not as ideal as, as what you would like. There's another question. Can you cohort residents in the yellow zone, even if they'll be at different stages of the 14 day quarantine? Uh, my understanding is yes. Mm -hmm. You can, because obviously a lot of them will be in different stages and you. Yeah, and this is kind of complicated. This question has come up and I know there are some infection, infection preventionists on, um, on right now, so they can weigh in. You know, the whole concept of bringing people out from the hospital and cohorting them for 14 days when you're bringing new people in that are in different points in time during their their uh, quarantine and then you know this may be a, a resident who's going to return to a long-term care floor but what if the you know they end up a roommate of someone who has who just came out of the hospital and they're at day 14 you know is it is it potential that you know, now you've put someone who's ready to move on to a long-term care floor and someone who's just started their quarantine. It gets really messy. Um, you know, the general guidance has been 14-day um, quarantine and then move them along. What we've tried to encourage sites to do is to be mindful of when you're rooming people, especially if there are shared rooms, shared bathrooms, and try to match them up so that they're close in time to when they've come out of the hospital. So that means they're also close in time to when their quarantine is over, but that is not perfect. So the system, um, you know, is not perfect. But what I would say is that if your staff are doing a good job in your green zones with their hand hygiene, maintaining their masks, their eye protection, um, you know, that is just as critical as that quarantine time when they're in the yellow zone, when when the staff are also gowned and and um, and gloved. So. So therapy in the gym. That hasn't happened for months. <laughs> I mean, I've seen a lot of our therapists moving equipment all over the place. Um, uh, you know, the parallel bars. I don't know if I've seen them move the stairs, but. Yeah, I mean, really, it's been in room. Now, I do know in special circumstances where, you know, the therapist really needs to assess a resident, you know, doing stairs or something where they can't move the equipment into the room. And honestly, moving the equipment into the room, then you got to clean the equipment down. So I'm not sure if, you know, it's any less work. Um, what I've seen is the patient comes out with a mask on, they'll go to the gym, do that activity. But the gym is really, it's not for kind of the, um, where you would normally have three or four people in doing their sessions at the same time it's really kind of a the therapist brings the resident out of the room masked goes to the gym does their exercise comes back and then that equipment in the gym is wiped down i, I think that's how i've seen many sites execute this but again these are sites where there aren't COVID outbreaks they're quarantining um, patients because they've come out of the hospital but they're not symptomatic and have had a negative test um, really in circumstances where you have, you know, an outbreak and people have known exposures, known exposures, um, you know, really they're just doing the therapy in the gyms and they're really limiting the time of the residents coming out of the room, even if they are masked. Terry Regal has a question about um, your, that when you're really short staffed, can a provider, a nurse or a CNA leave the red zone? re-enter and on new PPE to work. That's, that's definitely not ideal. Yeah, um, so really the same zone for the duration of the entire shift yes. is, is what you should be aiming for. Now we understand there may be instances where the staff member works in a yellow zone one shift that day and then the next day reports and they need to work in the red zone. But ideally you wanna have a, you know, the staff assigned to that zone for the entire day. If you must move from um, zone to zone, and again, I would put that in the category of, of critical staffing, especially if you're moving, if you have a red zone because you have an outbreak, you know, you want to move from the, from the green to the yellow to the red. But again, that is not ideal. And at that point, you want to be thinking about, you know, do you need additional staffing support um, to be able to accomplish that, which is challenging, especially if you maybe have two residents 
Um, and it's hard to dedicate one staff member to a red zone if you have only two positive cases, right? That's when it becomes really a stressor on um, an already stressed system. Cindy just shared with everyone um, PA Han 220. Eye protection addition of face mask. Um, how do you define moderate substantial? So I think actually DOH just recently has started posting this. So I think almost all of us are at least in moderate. I think there's only one county in the whole state that might not be considered in moderate transmission right now. Um, now I have seen, and it's been very interesting through the pandemic, this, the counties that have been hit harder earlier um, are doing things that in our county, I'm looking going, well, isn't that interesting? They're wearing masks now, this was back in March. And then lo and behold, we're wearing masks. So you can also look around at other counties where there are higher transmission rates and, and know, um, you know what the recommendation or what will be happening. So if, you're, um, if your healthcare system is not yet uh, you know, mandating or requiring eye protection with direct patient care, that's probably coming. We know that that has come out already um, from, from CDC, and it's just a matter of time. And, and to be honest, you don't, if, if it's gonna add an extra layer of protection, you don't always have to wait for someone to mandate it. You can look at what, um, what is happening in communities around you where there is higher levels of transmission and know that you know, that is something that you should be preparing for if it's not been required already. I think we're getting a little lax about um, uh, about ma not about masks, but about um, face shields. But I think they are. You should think of face shields as the new surgical masks. Just put them on. So I have a question, actually, for uh, not just Dr. Osevala uh, for her input, but also for other administrators. There are 17 states that are on the PA quarantine list um, that ideally you go visit those states and come back to Pennsylvania, you should quarantine yourself for 14 days. So are you folks looking at where your physical therapy, your dialysis nurses are going for vacations? Because now people are going out for vacations. Um, uh, so are you folks monitoring that? Okay. That's good. I think that's been super difficult. I mean, I think even the hospitals are like, you know, terrified to even mandate a quarantine um, when their employees are reporting out. I think they're offering a variety of options, anything from testing to review where you went with your um, your supervisor um, before or when you before you return to work um, to understand what the risk may have been. Um, Someone just put in the chat, they test their employees that go on vacation upon return to work and then again at 14 days. So that's great. Um, you, I think it is, uh, it is, is very difficult to get your arms around because you could have large numbers of your workforce uh, returning from uh, hotspots and you may not have the warm bodies to put in their place to provide resident care. So it's, it's an impossible um, choice you're asked to make um, with their return. I think I'll go back to the basics. You know, it's are they wearing their proper masks, their eye protection, their hand hygiene. Um, you know, the other thing which I don't think has been very easy to enforce, but I think is going to come more is when when a provider enters the room asking the, the resident to cover their nose and mouth, which has been a recommendation since the beginning, but I know is has not been really well enforced even now that we have some visitors coming into the hospital. It's hit and miss whether or not they have their masks on when when a provider would you know comes to round on a on a patient. So that's something else to think about in your buildings is for your own residents. Not only when they leave the room, but if the nurse is coming in um, to the room, that they they um, even a tissue was recommended if you don't have adequate supply of masks to cover the nose and mouth. Um, we know that um, you know anything where both individuals have have their uh, nose and mouth covered can reduce transmission. Um, that's likely to require some prompting from the nurse when they enter. You know, Mr. Smith, can you please, um, you know, here you go. Can you cover your nose and mouth while I'm in here checking your blood, you know, checking your blood pressure or listening to your heart? Um, 
those are all things that we can do to increase the safety both for the residents and the staff. And I, I think that's one area that we haven't been, um, we haven't enforced as much as we could. And I think the residents, um, now some with dementia may not be able to comply, uh, but residents that are coherent, especially in your assisted living and personal care homes may be able to um, cooperate with that, with that request. Any other questions or comments from the group? I mean, I would be curious to see if there are uh, nursing home reps here that have opened up and share what has worked and what, you know, what are some of the challenges they're facing. Because the facilities I'm at are opening up soon, but none of them are open yet. So if anyone fits into that category, please feel free to unmute your microphone and, and share your story. Looks like a, a lot of us are in step one or two. Oh, yeah. The point of care test, so I mean, right now that equipment I don't, I know some facilities have received the point of care testing. As best I can tell, DOH is a little luke, at least the PA Department of Health is a little bit lukewarm on that testing um, in terms of its reliability. Um, as far as lab capacity, I know at least through the RICPs, um, all of us have been standing up uh, contracts with multiple commercial labs to try to increase capacity. The challenge is, is with many of the health systems across the state, uh, they themselves cannot get their hands on equipment to increase their own capacity, much less support the community nursing homes. But I think there's been a general push as well as the request from all of us for the state to lobby at the federal level on our behalf to, uh, to release the equipment to Pennsylvania. Um, most of the health systems have orders in for um, additional test equipment, but it's been um, held up at the federal level and being sent to areas where, where they have um, um, outbreaks. So, um, you know, from, it's very hard for some of the smaller nursing homes to be able to establish a lab contract. Uh, and so I would advise if you're on, if you're on from South Central or if you've joined from a different area of the state to reach out to your RICB because we do have um, anywhere, I know we have, um, uh, three commercial labs that we can connect you with um, and establish a contract with and um, can even support some of the employee testing for the duration of the grant. Uh, and then we're hoping that those contracts then you can carry forward for any additional testing needs after the period of the grant. Um, and because we're a bigger entity coming in as a regional um, effort, we've been able to kind of get um, some of those labs to sign on with us. Whereas if you're a facility that has 100 residents, that's harder to grab their attention and get the turnaround time and the contract you need in place quickly. So it's a good time if you're looking to establish with a lab to uh, reach out to the RICB and ask for assistance in making that connection. Before we go to Melissa's question, can we jump down to Cindy? Um, any health systems looking into using the Saliva Direct <laughs> Protocol? I mean, I think that was just authorized through an EUA for just the very first um, test this past week. I don't even think our health systems, at least none of them that I've interacted with through this collaborative, even like the idea of the interior nasal swab. So I don't know how they're gonna feel about the saliva test. Um, the DOH is fine with the interior nasal swab, but a lot of the labs have certain, they the health system labs have certain bars that need to be um, um, crossed before they are willing to accept um, different modalities. And I think um, SPIT is going to be one of those that is equally as challenging as getting them to approve the anterior nasal swab, um, which I think in the nursing homes is different because we are doing very, very large volume surveillance testing. It's kind of like the pooled analysis um, technology that is coming out with labs where even if the, um, the sensitivity of the test isn't perfect, just based on the sheer volume of testing, you're likely to catch positives in that. 
and the same actions will be required in terms of setting up yellow yellow zones and, and red zones. It's very different than the hospitals, which are really um, doing testing on people who are symptomatic. And so um, it's, it's definitely different. I think if you look at how universities are approaching their surveillance testing, that will give you a clue as to what may be acceptable for nursing home surveillance testing, because we're talking about massive number, three, four, five, six, seven, 800 tests at a time for one building um, for surveillance. So testing people that do not have symptoms. It's, it's very different than what the hospitals are utilizing their current testing for, which is really identifying people coming in with symptoms. Um, so that's, uh, it's, it's much different. So I didn't wanna lose Melissa's um, comment um, or challenge. Um, so for those who, who eventually watch our recording, I'll quickly read this. Communal dining and having more than one seating to maintain safe social distancing is difficult to get to the, the resident's patient care done as it tends to run into one meal to the next. So um, I'm not sure if anyone has um, suggestions or comments on that one. I'll agree. I mean, you know, especially if you have dementia residents and you normally have two or three residents at a table with an aide and you're feeding, you're trying to accomplish feeding. Um, the whole idea of having to keep individuals in their room and go room to room to feed is just not feasible for the volume of staff that you have. Um, I think somebody had a great idea. Plexiglass dividers is, you know, is one option. The other thing you can think of is, is if you have roommates, right, they're already exposed to one another in the room, pair them up at a table because they're, they're in close contact and constant contact in a room. So look at cohorting the way their rooms and the halls are set up as another option to try to um, um, consolidate the care without increasing exposure. So a lot of this is just thinking through who really needs to be in contact with these people if they're if the residents are already in contact with one another, then keep them paired. Um, and that way that reduces that need for the social distancing because they're already sharing a room and a bathroom um, and will allow you to maintain the distancing between, you know, a person who's on one end of the hall and another, you know, pair that are on the other um, side of the hall um, and, and still be able to accomplish the, the care that you're trying to provide for the residents. That would, you know, that would be one idea to try to, um, to try to keep everyone safe, but can keep um, the care consolidated. Are there any last questions or comments? So if there are any questions or comments um, and, and we run out of time, feel free to put them into the chat. Again, we'll follow up. We will do a summary of the Q&A and have that shared in um, the participant resource folder. Um, um, Aisha, Nikki, do you have anything that you'd like to say before we wrap up? No, it was great to have everyone's input. Thank you so much. No, and I would just say, you know, thanks for everyone's input. It's it's really helpful for to hear what you're experiencing and to share with us. Um, I feel like every time we have these conversations, there's a new scenario that I haven't encountered that I that we need to think through. And I think um, if anything, this has brought out our creativity and innovative ways to accomplish what, you know, used to be challenging in normal times, but is even more so now. So um, please continue to share your or ideas you've had um, to keep everyone safe, but try to um, soldier on with, with the resident care that you're providing um, every day. So thank you all. Yes, thank you to everyone for your engagement. We, you will be receiving an email shortly, which contains a link to the evaluation and again to our participant resources folder. Um, if you're claiming CME credits, you would need to complete the evaluation. If you're not claiming CME, we'd ask that you still complete it as it helps us to continue to improve our sessions. And finally, we hope to see you again on September 3rd at 2 p.m. And for those who have seen some of our, uh, or participate in our other skilled nursing facility echoes, um, Dr. Gavin McGregor Skinner will be joining us for that lecture. So thank you everyone and have a great day.